Uh, hello and welcome to this Second Nature webinar on engaging in cross-sector climate action with local and state slash provincial government officials. Uh, my name is Alex Maxwell and I am the manager of cross-sector climate programs at Second Nature. And before I start by introducing our speakers and briefly their talks, I would like to take care of a few housekeeping items. So just that, uh, so that you are aware, this webinar is being recorded. After the webinar, you will receive a link to the recording via an email, which you can then use to watch the webinar again, uh, and of course, share it with your colleagues. During the webinar itself, all attendees will be muted. And to ask questions, we please ask that you use the chat window on the GoToWebinar platform. These questions will be curated and collected throughout the webinar and asked of our panelists during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Now to briefly introduce our panelists. So today I'm excited to have with me uh, Dennis Karlberg, who is the Associate Vice President for Sustainability at Boston University. I'm also joined today by John Madden, Director of Sustainability and Engineering, Campus and Community Planning from the University of British Columbia. Uh, Marjorie Kaplan, uh, the Associate Director of Rutgers Climate Institute from the State University of New Jersey, Rutgers. And lastly, Peter Styling, who is the Assistant Vice Provost of Strategic Initiatives and the Director of the Office of Sustainability at the University of Florida. So, now, without further delay, I would like to hand it over to our very first speaker, Dennis Carlberg. Thank you, Alex. Do I have control now? Yes, you should have control. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to speak today. I think this is a really exciting panel, and I think it's really important work that uh, we've, we're all doing, uh, particularly those that are uh, listening in. Uh, I want to talk about uh, the work we do with the Boston Green Ribbon Commission. Um, and Alex, I'm not okay. controlling here. Um, okay. Um, do we have any community that is not already set up in here? Okay, maybe I should just advance the slides. Let's just go that way. Sure. Okay, the mission of the Green Ribbon Commission is uh, centrally to uh, convene leaders for Boston's, uh, from Boston's key stakeholder uh, groups to support the implementation of the city's climate action plan. Next slide. We have a common agenda, which is to get the carbon free and climate ready. Next. The, from a carbon-free perspective, uh, the city's emissions in 2015 was 7.2 million metric tons of CO2. Uh, Two-thirds of that came from the building sector. The city set a goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. Next. And 85% of the buildings in 2050 uh, already exist. Alex, you're going way too fast. Uh, Climate ready is really uh, addressing sea level rise, increased storm intensity, increased heat, and environmental justice. Next slide. The city uh, established a climate action plan in 2007 and has updated it several times. Most importantly, in 2016, to set carbon free as its goal. That's for the entire city. That's not just municipal activities. Next slide. It starts with leadership. Uh, Mayor Menino brought together the members of the Green Ribbon Commission uh, because he realized there's no way that the Climate Action Plan goals could be met if he didn't engage the key stakeholders and frankly, the largest emitters. So President Brown at Boston University, other presidents at other universities and CEOs meet with the mayor on a, uh, twice a year to address climate change issues. Uh, we have three, or we have 35 members now. It was 30 initially, and we have four sector working groups: higher education, commercial real estate, healthcare, and cultural institutions. Next slide. Um, I have, 
The Higher Ed Working Group is made up of Boston University, Harvard, MIT, Northeastern University, and UMass Boston. Affiliate members currently include Tufts and Emerson, Tufts University and Emerson College. We're actively trying to get uh, more affiliate members to participate. Next slide. Reinforcing activities are critical uh, to our ongoing work. Next slide. Again, it starts with leadership. The president, CEOs, and mayor meet uh, um, twice a year, and the working groups meet monthly. Next slide. We convene on a series of issues. Next slide. From convening around the Climate Action Plan, uh, preparing for climate change. Next slide. Uh, we've held several Green Lab Symposia. Uh, the most important one that really kicked it all off was a one-day symposium uh, with Wendell Brasse from UC Irvine, uh, who brought his team with him and really helped us all understand uh, not only higher ed, and this, is, this is all cross-sector work. Um, so uh, commercial real estate folks that are building lab space, uh, people from the lab world, there's a lot of biotech in Boston, as well as higher ed. We engage with I2SL and local utilities as well. Next slide. Uh, renewable energy has been a major theme since 2015. Uh, we formed the Renewable Energy Purchasing Network, which is really just a group of folks uh, who are interested across sectors uh, to get renewable energy for their operations. Um, and uh, in 2015, we established a Renewable Energy Prize, which was funded by the Barr Foundation, $100,000 for, for the organization or group of organizations that was able to get a power purchase agreement uh, uh, in, the, in the works, uh, and they had to have a uh, signed agreement, not final agreement, but um, initial agreement to move forward and get that prize. Endicott College and Tufts University won the award. Uh, MIT, Boston Medical Center, and uh, Post Office Square Associates have aggregated a large-scale solar project in North Carolina, and the Boston University Wind Project all grew out of the process that we sort of built the foundation, built the knowledge, built the network, and uh, it continues to grow. Next slide. We've also convened around uh, public health with Harvard and BU uh, Schools of Public Health, brought in the New York Times. They do a lot of really great communications around climate change. So. It was a day-long session to, to really address healthcare and communications around climate change. Next slide. Uh, another convening was with first movers, uh, essentially the organizations that are moving first on renewable energy, energy efficiency, and thermal, uh, geothermal, essentially. Um, so sharing knowledge on sort of a constant, almost, basis. Next slide. Uh, we held a deep dive on with a renewable energy workshop, um, a one day workshop uh, that really got into the details of how to do large scale renewable energy, brought in the experts uh, to really peel away the mystery of uh, renewable energy and power purchase agreements and virtual power purchase agreements. Uh, out of that has come a number of projects that are being developed uh, or being uh, negotiated, contracts negotiated. Next slide. Uh, bring your own problem. This was a fun thing we did uh, with the Green Ribbon Commission, Second Nature, and NG uh, to have organ. This was really higher ed; it wasn't cross sector, uh, but uh, all the different schools and colleges brought uh, their own problem for us all to uh, noodle through. I think it was a pretty effective event. Next slide. So results and shared measurements. Next slide. These are all reports I'm going to walk through, and we're not about putting reports on shelves. We're about putting reports in action. So uh, we started with the BRAG, the Boston Research Advisory Group, which was uh, essentially the climate scientists, many of the climate scientists uh, from 
uh, BU, Harvard, MIT, and University of Massachusetts, uh, who are doing the work for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We're doing not the work, but a lot of the work. Um, and for the National Climate Assessment. So these are experts that are looking at the global global climate change, but look, but in this case, through the brag, they were focused on local climate impacts. Next slide. The result of that was Climate Ready Boston, uh, which was solutions focused based on those uh, the, based on the science. Next slide. Uh, and also in 2016, we developed uh, renewable energy procurement guidance. Uh, next slide. 2017, uh, this was an interesting labs benchmarking study working with I2SL uh, okay. metrics, uh, but on a local basis. Uh, next slide. Uh, financing this stuff is really critical, and uh, uh, UMass Boston led the charge on uh, financing for climate resilience. Next slide. Uh, we did an update uh, the following year on the lab work. Uh, next slide. So we've collected a lot of really good data across all the institutions, major institutions and the Green Ribbon Commission. Uh, feasibility of a, a harbor barrier. This was a, an idea that a lot of people had to save Boston from sea level rise. Uh, and good report that came out of UMass Boston. And we all uh, did some collaboration on that. Next slide. Uh, carbon-free Boston. Uh, this was how uh, is Boston going to get to be carbon-free to meet its goal to be carbon neutral by 2050. This established through modeling uh, a look at the policies and programs the city would need to put in place in order to meet its goal. Next slide. Another important part of carbon-free is social equity. Uh, there was a major report put together that tied those two things closely together climate change and social equity. Next slide. Uh, one important outcome was the Building Energy Reporting and Disclosure Ordinance, uh, which, next slide, is essentially putting Energy Star labels on buildings. Uh, how is your building performing? Uh, and publishing this on an annual basis. And then also reducing energy use intensity by 15% uh, every five years is one of the requirements here. This is now moving into uh, building emissions reporting and disclosure ordinance. Uh, and I have a call coming up at three o'clock that's going to be, uh, we're working on, on the next version of, the, of what we're calling uh, the building emissions reporting and disclosure ordinance. Next slide. So evolution, I'll go quickly through these next couple slides here. Uh, we went through a strategic planning process for the higher ed working group last year. Out of that came five high level goals. One, support climate change planning among other higher ed institutions. So for those who have been able to get through the process, how do we improve? Next slide. Uh, we have a lot of research uh, institutions involved with the Green Ribbon Commission. So take advantage of our research abilities and find collaborative opportunities around climate change. Next slide. We need to transfer knowledge. We need to communicate these things to a broader audience and really cut across sectors. Next slide. Uh, cross sector uh, engagement really to address the city's climate action plan. Next slide. Out of, out of this has come the uh, Green Ribbon Commission Climate Action Exchange. Again, this is cross-sector uh, knowledge sharing. Next slide. Okay, backbone support. We couldn't do this without uh, some serious support. Next slide. Starts with the mayor, good organization, both in the mayor's office in, this, in City Hall and uh, within the working groups. Next slide. Funding is critical. The Bar Foundation provided the initial funding and provides ongoing funding, as well as all these other organizations. Next slide. So this all creates an environment that we can all achieve our sustainability goals. Uh, for information on this is greenribboncommission.org. Uh, all the 
all the documents that I showed, plus many others, are available there for folks to dig into. Thank you. So, if you think Intel uses first, and then uh, add an extra Next, we'll hear from uh, John Madden at the University of British Columbia. Great, thanks, Alex. Uh, hello, everybody, and thank you, Dennis. What a great presentation it shows the impressive scope and breadth of work that you're doing in Boston. So great work there. Um, I'm really happy to be uh, joining everybody today, and thanks for joining uh, me. I just wanted today to share with you uh, some of the experiences that we're having at UBC um, in terms of the partnerships with different levels of governments and organizations that are helping to advance climate action policy. Um, next slide, please. So I have about 13 slides to go through that will provide an overview of the UBC context, our campus as a living lab partnership model, and dive into two case studies around partnerships. One is the partnership with Metro Vancouver and UBC, and the second being the multi-level government partnership to pilot net zero energy buildings and advance climate policy uh, for not only UBC, but the province of British Columbia. And then I'll just finish with some key takeaways and observations based on our experience in developing those partnerships. Next slide. So just to provide a little bit of context, the UBC sits on the western edge of Metro Vancouver, surrounded by over 2,000 acres of Christine Regional Park overlooking the Salish Sea, which you can see in the foreground of that photo. Um, and the city of Vancouver and the 21 member municipalities that make up the metropolitan area are in the background. UBC was endowed with over 1,000 acres of land by the province in the early 1900s. UBC is not only the owner, it is the regulator, the inhabitant of the land and the buildings. We essentially operate like a small city with a daytime population cresting over 80,000 people. The province has enabled UBC with the governing authority to not only develop, regulate and operate over 500 buildings. So there's a really strong rationale and support for advancing high performance buildings on the campus through requirements defined in our climate action plan and our green building action plan. Next slide, please. So a little bit about the Campus as a Living Lab partnership model. Campus as a Living Lab projects really bring together collaborations of academic researchers, students, staff, and partners to undertake innovative projects across a range of different scales. The Campus as a Living Lab uh, initiative really supports the design and construction of innovative buildings, energy systems, transportation networks, food systems, as well as discrete educational or research projects. These projects aim to address the connection between the ecological, the social, and the human health, as well as technological issues while supporting academic mandates and supporting well-being of our campus community. The UBC campus provides a really rich laboratory, uh, our physical plant, our physical spaces, our human systems, in which we design, test, study, and learn from the social and technological innovations in real time and in real world contexts. They support the collaborative experimentation, piloting of innovations with industry, and also the critical assessment of results whether that be failures or successes. And we really want to uh, disseminate the exchange of knowledge and the findings of those results. Next slide, please. So the first case study I want to share with you is the partnership that we had with Metro Vancouver. And Metro Vancouver is essentially analogous to a county government. Um, we created the Memorandum of Understanding, which was completed in 2015. And the MOU, or Memorandum of Understanding, sets out a number of objectives. Uh, two of the more salient objectives are provided on this slide. One is it provided a non-binding uh, framework for improved partnership and opportunities for collaboration and joint initiatives with the university and the Metro Vancouver government. The second thing it did is it 
had a shared commitment to the principles of sustainability and the belief that the long-term viability, prosperity, and sustainability of the region requires approaches to problem solving that are characterized by innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, and collaboration. Next slide. So the MOU was an instrument that really helped to identify new opportunities to share knowledge and research findings and to jointly undertake research to further both organizations individual and shared goals and collaborate in a, the development of approaches designed to address important regional and global sustainability challenges. The scope of activities were organized into three thematic buckets, research, learning and innovation, operations and infrastructure and regional prior, uh, prosperity. On the first one, research, learning and innovation, UBC and Metro Vancouver had had a long history of collaboration of individual research projects and joint initiatives. What was really interesting through the process is that the UBC administration had no way of tracking the vast number of projects and engagements because many were based on the individual network of the faculty involved. Uh, faculty researchers are very entrepreneurial. They like to work independent of the administration. But through the MOU drafting process, we found that Metro Vancouver and UBC had over 200 active projects uh, that we were working on together. Uh, and that ranged from phosphate recovery and solid waste to air quality monitoring, gray water recycling, water conservation initiatives, uh, low impact development and infrastructure resiliency, just to name a few. On the operations and infrastructure piece, UBC really depended on the regional infrastructure and service delivery from Metro Vancouver, for which there were some real key legacy issues to address some specific issues around stormwater management and cliff erosion uh, that was happening through coastal erosion forces. The MOU provided a renewed commitment to proactively identifying the priority issues of which we collaboratively action and should be considered in, and developed in terms of a joint approach for action, including the development of you know, resourcing and funding frameworks to support the implementation of those actions. And the third area was around regional prosperity. Both Metro Vancouver and UBC play an important role in facilitating multi-party discussions and efforts aimed at supporting prosperous and sustainable region. At the second, as the second biggest economic generator in the region, UBC really performs a catalyst role for research, learning, and innovation. And as a large public landholder, we had clearly articulated development plans, and UBC's involvement in the region's prosperity and sustainability was really deemed to be critical. So I just wanna highlight two initiatives that emerged from this MOU. Next slide. And click. So the first initiative was a research-led project uh, to address coastal adaptation responses. Metro Vancouver region is really bounded by ocean and bisected by rivers, as you can see on the next image. It provides the critical habitats for marine life, migratory birds, and it emerged as a key economic and logistical node within the Pacific Rim. It is also one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in Canada, with a population of over 3 million people. Coastal adaptation requires both large scale and localized planning in the design efforts for both the short and long term. Uh, click for the next image, please. Uh, UBC's Coastal Adaptation Lab, or CAL for short, aims to develop novel planning, design, and policy solutions for coastal adaptation based on the co-production of knowledge between researchers, decision makers, and Indigenous communities. The approach in integrates research that are happening largely uh, studied independently from each other, including critical infrastructure, uh, coastal uh, habitat encroachment, nature-based solutions, managed retreat, all within this overarching envelope of adaptation and indigenization. In doing so, CAL, for short, aims to develop frameworks that transform the way we approach the coastal adaptation by placing climate, 
and spatial justice at the center of developing solutions to coastal communities, both human and ecological, and adapt to increase flood risk and uncertain futures. Next slide, please. Another positive outcome from the MOU was the expansion of UBC's Sustainability Scholars Program, which expanded to Metro Vancouver shortly after the MOU was signed. Uh, the Scholars Program is an in innovative paid internship program that matches graduate level students with on and off campus sustainability partners to work on applied research projects that advance sustainability in the region. The program matches a client that will define a project or an issue or a problem statement and have the students work on developing evidence-based research to support the advancement of policy programs and projects. The students get paid and gain valuable work experience in a professional working environment. They develop applied skills and knowledge under the guidance of a mentor while enabling the student to build a professional network that enhances career opportunities. Next slide, please. The client uh, and the staff of Metro Vancouver oversaw the student progress towards meeting defined deliverables. Some examples of project reports that had helped Metro Vancouver and the member municipalities include the City of New Westminster to develop an EV charging parking strategy and the formulation of transportation demand management strategies that reduce climate emissions, and also helped uh, bring forward topic-based reports and background studies to inform Metro Vancouver's Climate Action 2050 strategies. At the completion of their project, the students present the uh, audience of client, peers, faculty, and staff with an opportunity for questions and a robust dialogue uh, to address the issues. Next slide. The Scholars Project Library uh, was developed uh, and includes hundreds of reports, charts, toolkits, and more documenting the applied research produced uh, by the scholars since 2010. The image on the screen is just a screenshot showing an abstract and the report topics with full links to the reports and the analysis. The reports are available to the public and staff as a compendium of research and analysis to inform climate policy. Next slide. The next case study is one of a multi-level partnership between UBC, the campus, the city, the province, and the federal government to deliver an affordable housing project on the UBC campus. Uh, the project is designed to be a Passive House certified project. Uh, Passive House buildings, for those that are not familiar, are designed such that they're super insulated in terms of their envelope. They eliminate thermal bridging uh, and constructed super airtight and optimizes use of solar passive gains like orientation, the glazing ratios, daylighting, and utilization of heat recovery from domestic hot water and internal heat loads to address all the thermal energy demands. It is also designed to be uh, solar ready uh, with rooftop solar with the aim to be net zero ready. Next slide, please. So this multi-level partnership is largely formed on the alignment and ambition and mandates to achieve high performance build buildings, acknowledging that buildings represent over 40% of total carbon emissions globally. United by this common vision, this partnership provides a strong value proposition and alignment of goals with the partners involved. The diagram uh, really illustrates the relationships between those different parties with their mandates, missions, and roles that UBC engaged with on this project. UBC is fortunate to be located proximate to the city of Vancouver, who are really aggressively pursuing renewables and decarbonizing their building stock. The ZEBEX program, initiated by the city of Vancouver, or what's called the Zero Emissions Building Exchange, helps to support the rapid acceleration of market transformation, knowledge transfer, uh, not only in the city, the UBC, but also across the province. The next partner was UBC Properties Trust, and they are essentially the developer that is responsible for delivering affordable housing for the UBC community, and really ensure that the project is delivered on time and on budget. The province was keenly interested to get involved because this project pilots uh, the highest 
uh, step code of a recently developed provincial energy step code, which supports the advancement of the BC building code, as well as the provincial clean BC climate plan, which has ambitions to transition all new construction of buildings to be net zero ready before 2032. Natural Resource Canada granted $3.5 million under the federal government's new green infrastructure program and helped to advance the federal government's uh, pan Canadian framework on climate action and pilot new approaches to high performance buildings. The grant also earmarked 500,000 K uh, dedicated to monitoring and research to inform future evolution of the National Energy Building Code uh, for buildings and to better understand the human thermal comfort issues and building performance dynamics in the context of climate change. Next slide. So this matrix really illustrates the strong alignment of interests with all the partners around advancing climate action, policy and advancing high performance buildings, and using monitoring and research findings as part of a broader knowledge transfer and dissemination, as well as illustrating the leadership and innovation in the building sector. The project and the supporting research helps to advance climate and building policy and regulations. The involvement of each of the partners uh, at different levels of government recognized that there was a strong value proposition and a strong alignment with the respective mission and mandates. So just to finish off here, just a key um, observations from these two uh, case studies. Uh, one is to really find issues and topics of mutual interest where there's strong alignment around policy objectives. The second is identify the value propositions that benefit the university and the partners involved. What we heard most from the partners is that there had to be something in it for them. And thirdly, find ways to leverage resources. So the universities are in a unique position to leverage their resource, their brain trust to sustainability scholars, um, you know, faculty research, and also leveraging external funding and industry partners to advance climate action and climate policy. And lastly, just building strong governance structures to support and steward the relationships to sustain really long-term success. So that concludes my presentation. And at this point, I just wanna pass it over to Marjorie Kaplan at Rutgers University. Thank you, John and Marjorie. You're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Alex? Yes, we can hear you. We can hear you well. Great. Great. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about our experiences at Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, on engaging cross-sector climate action at the state and local level. And it's been wonderful to hear my colleagues, Dennis and John, and I'm looking forward to hearing Peter. Um, like many universities, our core mission is that of teaching, research, and service, or as I've chosen to emphasize here, as learning, discovery, and engagement. And these are terms I borrowed from those cited in a 2000 Kellogg Commission report related to land-grant institutions, of which Rutgers is one. It's perhaps a little bit of semantics, but I like this framing better, as it better describes the work I do with some of my colleagues. And we, perhaps tongue-in-cheek, call ourselves pracademics. But in reality, much of what we do is conduct research and analyses related to climate change that can be made usable across various sectors at the state and local level in New Jersey. And so I'm going to give you a small glimpse of that today, and I'm only going to talk about one um, case study. There's many other things that go on here at this university, but I figured I'd just leave it to one. Um, first, I'll discuss this concept in an overarching fashion across the state of New Jersey, and then I'll provide you with this one more focused example. Um, oh, did I tell you, not, did I, did I tell you to advance to the next slide so you are on the right slide? It's hard to see. Um, yes, you are on the right slide. So if you could ex advance to the next slide, that would be wonderful. Slide three. Um, Almost 10 years ago, at a time when the government support in the state of New Jersey for addressing climate change had waned, uh, the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance formed at a Rutgers-hosted cross-sector workshop on climate preparedness for decision makers. 
It's a nonpartisan boundary organization that I am privileged to co-facilitate at the university with my colleague, Jean Herb, who is at the Rutgers Blaustein School for Planning and Public Policy. The Alliance is composed of representatives of diverse and leading organizations in the state representing the private sector, NGOs, public and academic sectors, all sharing the common goal of furthering science-informed climate change strategies at the state and local level here in New Jersey. And its initial focus was on climate preparedness, and two years ago it added um, emissions reductions, climate mitigation, into its portfolio. But what I'm going to talk about today is on the preparedness side. Uh, two former New Jersey governors from different political parties lend their support and names as honorary co-chairs of our alliance, Thomas Kane and James Florio. Um, for those of you who may remember, Governor Kane may best be known outside of our state for chairing the 9-11 Commission, and Governor Florio is well known nationally in environmental circles for his work in Congress as father of the landmark Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation and Liability Act, better known as the Superfund. So if you would uh, please go to the slide four, that would be great. Um, Guided by extensive stakeholder engagement across a range of sectors representing agriculture, coastal communities, environmental justice, emergency response, environmental organizations, natural resources, public health, transportation, social services. We also include utilities and water resources, among others. The Alliance supports analyses and research. It's produced over 50 reports that encompass these sectors. They address impacts. We reports address vulnerability, best practices, options for state and local considerations related to climate change, adaptation, and mitigation. Slide five, please. In addition, the Alliance has developed and deployed decision support tools and conducts outreach and education through various modalities, including the reports I mentioned, conferences, workshops and videos. An important point that I want to make is that with a nexus to the state university as its facilitator, we have access, the Alliance has access to experts who can guide and assist the work very often in kind, as well as supervise and train student researchers. Next slide, please. I mentioned I'd like to also dive a little deeper in terms of cross-sector engagement, resulting in state and local climate action through this one example. One of the areas that stakeholders had identified and the Alliance reported out on back in 2014 was the need for a science and technical panel to be convened to conduct a climate impact assessment for New Jersey to help guide state policy. Even though there was no movement at this time on this by the state government leadership, as facilitators of the Alliance and with the in-kind assistance of faculty, we did convene a science and technical advisory panel limited to sea level rise and changing coastal storms because that seemed to be a pretty important thing. And it included experts in climate science, geology, coastal engineering, oceanography, hydrology, uh, people who work on vulnerable populations and communities. And these were drawn from our deep bench of experts in house here at the university, but also experts from other academic institutions and from government as well. Next slide, please. We coupled our expert panel process to a practitioner panel from across a number of state and local sectors. And these practitioners represented a range of, of areas from environmental organizations to transportation, housing, building code folks from across state and local government agencies and organizations. We included engineering consultants, county and municipal planners, floodplain managers, emergency response officials, municipal engineers, real estate experts, folks representing utilities, and the like. And the practitioner panel was important because it provided feedback to the science panel in terms of information preferences, for example. The scientists wanted to have uh, two planning regions based on the geology of New Jersey, um, as evidenced from this comment by one of the scientists on the left. Um, and whereas the practitioners said this wouldn't make any difference in a practical way. And they also thought this would be really hard, way too difficult to implement from a practical perspective. So the scientists, they got it. And that idea was dropped as just an example. 
And overall, the process resulted in an assessment regarding changes in coastal storms, projections of sea level rise, and a planning framework that we put together for resilience practitioners. Next slide, please. Um, augmenting the sea level rise projections and planning framework and providing some examples for how to implement it, this STAP report, as we call it, the Science Technical Advisory Panel Report, um, we also conducted a separate analysis of the existing state of resilience practice for sea level rise in New Jersey, examining federal, state, and local approaches. And this affirmed local and practitioner support for statewide uniform guidance, as well as regulatory and planning implementation at the statewide level, and provided further context for ways to incorporate the projections that the staff had developed and the approach in planning processes and practice. Next slide, please. So what happened with this information, this informal guidance, if you will, on sea level rise, and this assessment of what the needs were for local and statewide planning? Well, here are some examples of what's resulted in terms of state and local actions from this work. The scientific data, coupled with the planning framework and contextual information, became the basis for the state of New Jersey's coastal management program. Uh, they're embracing the work and using it for a NOAA, which is an uh, national organization uh, for, for a no funded pilot program in which Rutgers was asked to partner. The project, known as the New Jersey Frames Project, ended up in developing a draft 15 municipality regional resilience plan in Monmouth County, New Jersey. The project was heavily informed by county and local municipal and community engagement, and the STAP projections, as I mentioned, were incorporated. In addition, on the right-hand side, I'm illustrating that the 2016 STAP projections were also incorporated into New Jersey's most recent update to its statewide hazard mitigation plan for the State Office of Emergency Management. Next slide, please. Further, uh, just about a year ago, um, the newly minted State of New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's Chief Resilience Officer came to Rutgers and they asked us to update the 2016 report, but they needed it immediately. <laughs> and we managed to get a three month timeline out of them. And so we reconvened the expert panel and we reconstituted the practitioner panel as well. And although this product was not a product of the Alliance, without the foundational work that the university had developed under the auspices of the Alliance in 2015 and 2016, we could never have pulled this off so rapidly at the time we were asked. Um, key updates include historical sea level rise information for New Jersey to provide a frame of reference for the projections, updating information on ice sheet dynamics, and expanded consideration of nuisance or better known as sunny day flooding, including projections of sunny day flooding. I'd like you to go to the next slide, please. Um, so just um, to, to show you as evidence that we did produce numbers, since 1911, uh, the, state of the, the start of tide gauge records in Atlantic City, uh, sea level has risen in New Jersey 17.6 inches or one and a half feet, compared to a global average of uh, 7.6 inches or 0.6 feet. And the information you hear, see here is from the staff report. The top table is the projections under different scenarios and for different time horizons. And as I mentioned, we also developed values for sunny day or nuisance flooding. And we were very lucky because we had Dr. William Sweet, who's the nationally recognized expert on um, high tide flooding. And we were able to um, provide projections. Um, and for instance, it was calculated that Atlantic City, for example, by 2030, there'll be between uh, 17 to 75 nuisance flood days a year. So you'll see that we had started in, in the 1950s, we had an average of less than one high tide flood event for, per year, but for Atlantic City, data show that between 2007 and 2016, there were an average of eight of these events a year, ranging from four in 2007 to 18 in 2009. So this is an important um, bit of information that we were able to pull together. Next slide, please. Um, other ways in which this information has become very useful is under an October 2019 executive order 
by the governor of New Jersey, Governor Murphy. A scientific report on climate change was to be issued by the state of New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection just this past April. And although it was understandably delayed slightly because of the pandemic, it did come out uh, just recently on June 30th. And the state is using the sea level rise projections by the STAP because they have a New Jersey specific focus. Next slide, please. In addition, under a January executive order issued by the governor and a concurrent administrative order by the state DEP, New Jersey has now set forth a comprehensive timeline of climate change actions. And I'll just like highlight a few related to the STAP report. For example, the state expects to be issuing sea level rise guidance to provide builders, designers, and regulators what they're calling a science-based standard for building and design through 2050 for consistent review of permits and approvals. And further, they are going to be developing a suite of environmental land use rules to incorporate climate change considerations to address flooding and sea level rise. And in all likelihood, these guidances and rules will rely heavily on the STAP report, which is in effect endorsed in the state's climate science report. Um, that's kind of groundbreaking, I think. We'll see what happens. Um, in addition, at Rutgers, we have updated our flood mapper decision support tool to comport with the STAP report, as well as we're providing municipal snapshots of assets at risk. These in response to what we heard from our stakeholders around the state, including state and local government officials, who continue to provide end user input as we continue to expand and modify this and other climate related decision support tools that include things like temperature and precipitation for data and uh, data for New Jersey and look at other risk factors. Next slide, please. In conclusion, Based on what we've learned through engaging stakeholders across sectors is that universities provide opportunities for developing and disseminating trusted expertise and information on climate change, including information that's locally relevant. Universities also provide a forum to facilitate independent, nonpartisan continuity across political administrations. And we have continued to facilitate the New Jersey Climate Change Alliance as well through two different governors, and it is still going strong. We've also learned that universities provide wonderful opportunities to collaborate with practitioners, decision makers, and stakeholders, resulting in the co-production of usable, natural, and social science data to help address one of the thorniest issues of our time. Next slide, please. I'd like to quickly acknowledge not only all the wonderful participants in the Climate Change Alliance over these past nine years, but also my fellow academics and colleagues at Rutgers. Next slide, please. And lastly, please reach out if you have any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marjorie. And I, yes, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Styling. Sorry about that, Alex. That's perfect. Peter, please feel free to take it away. Thank you, you guys. Um, I'm going to try and be uh, a little quick here to make up for some uh, some lost time. And I don't have many slides, so hopefully I'll be done in 10 minutes here. Um, this presentation is different from the ones you've already heard uh, because Florida as a state is way behind others in, in terms of thinking about climate change. In fact, um, under the last governor, you couldn't even use the word climate change. So this has hampered the work of, of our university, the University of South Florida, and other universities on climate change. So this presentation may be of more value for those of you who are starting out along this road, rather than those who are further along it. So in, in common with many other universities, we were invited to join UC3 in 2018 and be um, extended uh, an opportunity to uh, to convene and report a cross-sector climate forum involving the institution, relevant local government bodies, and business participants to talk about next steps for levering, leveraging research capacity and to assess goals and drive new solutions forward. And this is where it gets interesting because climate change is already affecting Florida. The sea level around Florida is eight inches higher than it was in 1950. So my engineer colleagues suggested that a reduction in carbon dioxide emissions would solve everything. So you would think that a focus on renewables would be great for um, electricity generation, but we focused on resiliency. So how did we get there? Alex, if you could advance the slide. 
that would be great. So I'm going to turn myself off there from the, the, the camera so you can look at this a little better. And, and, and probably you, you've already, you're already familiar with this. There's the US electric generation by source. And OK, where are renewables? Well, they're down there, 16.9%. Well, there's hydropower. Well, Florida doesn't have any of that. And there's wind. Well, we don't have any of that either, really, because we're such low latitude. So let's see solar. Oh, yeah, solar, 1.5% of the share of total. Hmm. But Florida, although it calls itself the sunshine state, um, is, is way behind when it comes to the use of solar power. It trails many other states, including the not so sunny Massachusetts, New York and others. Georgia, just to the north of us, is a top 10 solar state. But in Florida, the state utilities have spent tens of million dollars on lobbying and political contributions to hinder the installation of residential solar power. The technology threatens the foundation of the power company's business. We really wanted to invite energy companies to the table, to our cross-sector forum, but they were unwilling to, uh, to engage. Even though these companies are proud to say they generate, they plan to generate even more of the electricity by solar if they have 10 new solar projects added. But you can't get data from them on the biggest users of electricity in the state. Is it hospitals or schools or whatever? To discuss energy conservation strategies. So our cross-sector forum, and, and there may be other states out there and participants listening who are in a similar boat, that went the way of resiliency. Um, so we convened discussion panels to discuss um, things that were important to us, but rather than have experts talk at the audience, we engaged folks. We had panels consisted of a, a content expert, often a scientist, a government practitioner who needed to put the science into practice, and an elected official who needed to develop uh, consensus necessary to enable action. So our idea was have to, to have discussions about what works, what doesn't work, and explore ideas on what each of these groups need from the others. We encouraged audience participation by the use of Slido, an audience participation app, and we discussed answers to these questions. We partnered with the, uh, a local Tampa Bay Regional Resiliency Coalition, a group of six councils and 21 municipalities, to come together to discuss climate change and to discuss regional responses for solving them. Can we have the next slide, Alex? Thanks. The good thing about partnering with uh, government bodies is that they can get a lot of folks to the table that academic institutions might not. Less, less than half the audience was academics. More than 50% were city, county and state workers involved in resiliency, together with representatives from engineering firms, businesses and other regional planning groups. And of the um, academics that were there, many were from non-STEM departments. For example, we had professors from English, the chair of communications, all of whom are interested in climate change communications. So the next slide, Alex, thank you. The panels um, were varied. Um, of course, one of the biggest uh, topics is extreme events such as sea level rise, but also high rainfall in our area. Often you get workers uh, uh, spouses who will call their, their workers and say, well, don't bother coming home for a couple of hours because we just had a heavy rainstorm and, and the streets are flooded. It really is a, a big issue here. And the consequences of this flooding, especially in transportation, are large. Many of the cars uh, here get to drive through brackish water, rusts out your brake systems. In the Florida Keys, numerous people complain that um, the, uh, the brake system fails and they're surprised to learn that it's, it's due to rusting driving through brackish water. Emergency vehicles suffer the same fate, like police vehicles and ambulances, but other transportation issues loom larger, especially the need to secure flood-free evacuation routes in case of impending hurricanes. So our second panel there was on transportation. Many of the traditional methods used to solve for sea level rise and flooding won't work in Florida, because seawater can flow through the porous ground up from below and under seawalls. In Miami-Dade, 
rising sea levels have allowed salt water to intrude into the drinking water and compromise sewage plants. There are already 120,000 properties at risk from frequent tidal flooding in Florida. The state is planning $4 billion in sea level rise solutions, including protecting these sewage systems, raising roads and stormwater improvements. So our third panel there um, was focused on the built environment. But climate change just doesn't affect the built environment, roads and sewers and drinking water. It can affect the spread of living organisms, including infectious diseases. As the regions get warmer, the comfort zones for many animals, including disease carrying mosquitoes such as Aedes aegypti, get broader. And with that is added risk for contacting mosquito borne diseases such as malaria and dengue fever. And if any of our attendees have had dengue fever, um, they'll know what I'm talking about. I have, it's not that present. Last year in October, the 18th case of dengue fever was recorded in the Tampa Bay area in Hillsborough County. But this one was different. The first 17 were found in travelers who got sick. This last case was locally contracted, which was a real worry. So that means that we have to um, be vigilant about the spread of these diseases. So our last panel there was um, on public health and social justice. Finally, our closing keynote was delivered by a state representative, Ben Diamond. Last year, Representative Diamond from St. Pete introduced a bill that would create a Florida climate and resilience research program within the Office of Resilience and Coastal Protection. And if there was one main take home message from the forum is that we need much greater engagement with our state and nationally elected representatives to push, to push a reduction in our carbon fo uh, fo footprint and reduce global warming. So to sum up, There we go, I pressed the wrong button. Since that forum, we've been trying to move forward with initial climate change initiatives. Of course, the pandemic has slowed everyone's work. But in April, we hosted a Solve Climate by 2030 campaign and a United Nations 75 climate change webinar, uh, where we had participants from the CLIO Institute, our climate, and our own climate change program at USF. Perhaps most exciting is that um, last this month, Laura Aguirre of the of Audubon, Florida, has moved to facilitate a conversation between Duke Energy and some Florida University sustainability directors about renewable energy and energy efficiency on campuses. I know uh, that Florida universities are very keen on such discussions. So while a lot of our work has been focused on resilience, I'm keen to engage. Um, energy companies on more renewable energy. And I'm hoping that we can expand these discussions, not just from university, about university campuses, but up to renewable energy at the state level and beyond. So um, there we are. It's where we're taking more baby steps than perhaps some of our esteemed college, colleagues. And it's great to know what's going on at other universities. But for those of you out there that aren't so far along, we know, we know how you feel and we're ready to help you if we can. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter. This is Alex jumping back in again. So thank you to, to all of our, our panelists for their talks here. I do want to allow a little bit of time for question and answers. So again, I'll encourage you to use the chat window if you have a question for our panelists. Uh, I've been collecting a couple as they've trickled in here, um, and I'll start by asking this first one, which is a question around um, perhaps engaging with, with smaller municipalities here. So the question is, have, have any of you worked with small municipalities, maybe on the order of around 10,000 people, uh, in developing climate programs? And if so, uh, how and, and, and to what extent? Um, so maybe for those folks that have um, dealt with smaller local communities uh, that want to weigh in, uh, please do so. I see Marjorie, you've turned you've turned your mic on, but uh, anyone can can jump in. 
Well, I'll I'll speak then. How's that? Since I turned my mic and I just figured you Thanks, wanted us to have all our mics on. Uh, but I'm happy to speak to that. So um, I think your question revolves around doing an entire climate plan for a small community. I personally have never worked with one small community to do that. Um, but we, we have worked with these, uh, just one for a whole climate action plan on that community. But um, there's a couple things. First of all, we do we have done this 15 municipality regional resilience plan, which included 15 municipalities, but it wasn't all of it wasn't comprehensive uh, to look at mitigation and adaptation. So that's one thing. Um, secondly, we have a lot of folks here that have been working over the years with over probably close to 40 municipalities on a getting to resilience. Um, component. So that's about resilience and not climate action. If I'm understanding your question, I just want to make sure I, I get at your question. Uh, but we also have an organization in our state called Sustainable Jersey, and their job, uh, a lot of what they do is working on sustainability planning at the local level. And it's a, um, it's a certification program. And so that's the way in which a lot of local communities engage on developing their plans. And state government is also working on resiliency planning with a lot of municipalities, if that answers your question. Thanks, Marjorie. Are there, there are other panelists that would like to chime in? Otherwise, we, we have another question, but um, I'll just open it up if anyone else had a comment on um, on, on climate programs within smaller municipalities. Alex, maybe I'll uh, just add uh, shortly that um, sure, so please, the, the faculty leadership of uh, Stephen Shepard at UBC, who runs uh, the Collaborative Advanced uh, Landscape um, Group, and he works uh, to develop uh, visualizations for smaller municipalities across British Columbia to understand, first of all, the impacts associated with climate and climate change, and also developing toolkits for education uh, of uh, different uh, ages and populations around climate literacy. And so it just, it takes a very uh, kind of um, engaged approach about understanding the issues and the impacts associated with climate change and builds kind of toolkits for uh, developing a climate action response plan. Great, thank you, John. Uh, we had we had another couple questions come in here. Uh, one of them being elements of justice and equity are rapidly emerging in uh, state, city, and, and university climate action planning. Um, how have you, uh, with your cross-sector climate action efforts, perhaps incorporated justice in your plans or your strategies or your approaches? Um, I'll open that up for all the panelists. I'm I'm happy to speak to it. I just didn't want to hog the the mic. Sure. Um, <laughs> so so uh, first of all, we do have um, justice organizations that participate in our alliance, uh, several of them, um, and we actually have a, a statement about now we've moved to a working group model where equity has to be um, incorporated. Um, on the work that we did on the 15 municipality regional resilience plan, which is not, was not done by our alliance, but I mentioned the plan, um, we made a very concerted effort to engage organizations, and we continue to do that with all of our work, um, organizations that represent vulnerable populations. Um, some of the work the alliance has has done actually has been pretty groundbreaking in that we did the first analysis of uh, social vulnerability um, indicators in terms of looking at the distribution of socially vulnerable pop populations across the state of New Jersey and what their risk to flooding um, has been in the 100 year and the 500 year floodplain. So we very much take it um, to heart here. Thanks, Margie. Any any of our other panelists like to speak to that question? Well, uh, here in uh, in the Tampa Bay area, we've uh, we've also been heavily engaged in um, sea level rise and the disproportionate effects on um, some of the disadvantages I, I get communities. So um, 
uh, there are multiple plans here in the Tampa Bay area which show the disproportionate effects on, on, on different folks and, and ways to mitigate for that in terms of uh, turning that land that is going to be more heavily flooded into, in, into, into a, I guess, park areas that, that won't be so, um, so disrupted if they, get, uh, if they get flooded. So it's a big part of our planning here too. As for the kind of disease frequency, it's not high enough yet, but um, certainly we've done some work on more um, chemicals and, uh, in, in the water supply and, and uh, locally and how that might uh, disproportionately affect certain groups. Maybe uh, I'll add also um, the University of British Columbia President Ono and the Board of Governors approved the Climate Emergency Declaration. And, in that climate emergency declaration, it also included specific language around commitments to addressing uh, social and climate justice as part of developing the plans and policies for the universities. And so we're engaging through um, a series of working groups uh, on that very topic to understand what the implications are on those that are most disadvantaged and, and marginalized communities that are impacted by climate change. For example, when we're developing policy around low carbon food systems, if, if the result of that is to uh, procure low carbon um, organic food that comes at a cost premium, what does that mean in terms of those people that can afford you know, basic food security um, and so we really have to take that lens on the policies and plans that we develop um, and really look at it from a lens and from the criteria of understanding what the knock-on impacts of the policies are going to be, especially on those uh, communities. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks, Peter and Marjorie as well for chiming in. Um, some of you may have noticed that Dennis is not uh, with us or responding to questions he had to hop off for uh, another call and I know we did get some questions specific to his involvement with the Green Ribbon Commission. Um, I will ask those questions of him if you would like to email me I'll quickly um, well if you would like to actually I would I would feel comfortable sharing uh, Dennis's contact information here but if you would like to ask him directly I know he he said folks could email him um, please feel free to do so about how you might get involved. Um, I know we're right at time here and I wanted to slip in uh, one, one other question here uh, before we close. Uh, and John, this is, this is actually directed at you. Would you, would you mind providing the name of, of the researcher again that uh, worked with smaller municipalities for the benefit of everyone? John, you might be muted. Sorry about that. Yes, no, no. Uh, Dr. Dr. Stephen Shepard, uh, who's uh, part of the Collaborative Advanced Landscape Group at UBC. Uh, and Alex, I can provide his contact information and a link to some of the uh, resource uh, kits uh, and information around the visualization um, efforts that they've been doing, as well as the toolkits for just education and capacity building for different uh, population groups. Great, yeah, if you provide that to me, I'll just mention this maybe in, in closing here, um, just as a reminder, we will be uh, sharing out the link to this webinar, uh, again, to the recording. Uh, in addition, in that email, we will include this summary of, of key takeaways and then responses to uh, some of your more specific questions with links to those resources in that same email. So you can you can look forward uh, to that um, in the next uh, day or two. Uh, but maybe uh, with that, I'd like to uh, just thank our speakers again and thank all of our attendees uh, for participating in this uh, this webinar. Um, and like I mentioned, we will follow up in a day or two with uh, an email with links to the, to the webinar and some responses to your more specific questions. Um, but please, please, if you have more additional questions, uh, feel free to reach out to us uh, here at Second Nature uh, or similarly uh, to our panelists. Um, 
directly if you have um, more specific questions on the, the plans, the approaches, the strategies that they mentioned uh, as part of this webinar. So with that, we'll conclude and thank you again. Um, we'll see you next time.